Hey, thank you for joining us at Revolution Church, where we are starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. Hey, if you ever have any questions, would like to support this ministry financially, or you just want to learn a little bit more about us, you can head over to our website at revyourlife.com. And be sure to give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram. And you know, we would love for you to stay connected throughout your week, wherever you may go with our Rev app. That's free and available for you to download wherever you might download your apps. We hope that you enjoy today's message. We're going to start a new series today. I'm calling it I Love My Church. We're going to give out free t-shirts during the series. I'm not telling you when, so just don't miss a single week or you'll miss the free t-shirt. All right, awesome. Okay, why would, why would we do a series called I Love My Church? You might be thinking, well, of course you would call it that, Zach. You get to be the pastor of a church of a thousand people. Listen, I want you to know something. I've loved this church since it was five people in my living room. I've loved this church since we didn't know if anyone was ever going to come to it. And I don't love this church because of the size I love this church because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why I love this place. And so I'm fired up you're here, and for four weeks, we're just going to have a conversation about what it should really mean when you say, I love my church. Because I think what a lot of people mean when they say, I love my church is, I love the music. Or, you know, I love the sermons. Or I love the experience. I love the kids' ministry. I I love this one certain thing that I love, can I just tell you, we need to think a little more deeper when it comes to the idea of loving our church. A little deeper. Because let's just take the music, for example. Like if the music is your thing and you're saying, I love my church because of the music, you're gonna walk in one week and they're gonna do a song you don't like. And you'd be like, oh, dang. Or you're gonna come, you're gonna love the sermons, yeah, 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 and then I'll get to a week where I preach on money. And you'd be like, oh, dang, right? Or whatever it is. See, those are important things. You should love those things. But can I just tell you, that's kind of a church hopper, church shopper mentality, if that's all you love. I want to challenge you to think deeper. For four weeks, I want to look at what really makes us a great church. I think this is a great place, a great people, a great movement that Jesus is doing here in our community. So let's do this. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them a couple things you love. Not the church, just things. Like I'd say, I love espresso. I love the spurs. Turn and tell them a few things. Go ahead, right now. Tell them a few things. I love your shirt. You could be nice and like compliment them. Yeah. That's good. Y'all are talking. I like that. I love exercise. I love fishing. I love donuts. That doesn't go with exercise, but I love both. All right, cool. Good, good. Now, isn't it funny how if you were at the office tomorrow and maybe you're around some people who don't really go to church or who aren't Christians, it'd be totally fine for you to say, I love all the stuff you just said. But then if you said, I love my church, they'd be like, what? Isn't that kind of funny? It's kind of weird out there in society to say, I love my church. I love my church. I just want to make sure that we have the right idea for four weeks about who we are as a church. What would make you say, I love these people. I love this place. I love who we are. Now, I also know a lot of Christians who would say, "Um, I don't love the church. I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. I would say it's a spiritual impossibility to love Jesus, but not love the church. Because the the Bible says the church is Jesus' bride, his wife. And listen, I love you. But if you come up to me and you're like, Pastor, I love you so much, but Amber, I don't like Amber. We're not friends anymore. I'm not hanging with you. I'm not talking to you. You want to love me? You better learn to love her. I think it's the same way with Jesus. Why else would he call the church his bride? It's a spiritual impossibility if you read through the Bible to love Jesus but not the church. And so I think there's a lot of things maybe that we can learn over the next few weeks. Let's pray. God, I pray that over the next several weeks you would show us what it really means to love the church, what the church actually is, who we're called to be, that the church isn't a place, it's not a building, it's not an event, it's people, it's us. That we are your change agents in this world. We are your ambassadors of grace and love and mercy. We're the ones called to create a culture where people can be rescued and changed. This is probably the most important conversation we're gonna have the entire year. So God, I pray we all open up our hearts right now that our minds would be ready to receive. We trust you 
speak to us. In Jesus' name, everybody said? All right, awesome. Hey, shake your notes around so I know you're ready and say, let's go, Pastor. All right, cool. I like how people shake their phones around because we got the notes on the phone. That's cool. All right. Awesome. I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 9 here in just a second. I'm calling today's message, man, I love the hospital. Everybody say, say what? No one loves the hospital. Even the people that work at the hospital don't love the hospital, right? It's just not the happiest place on earth. Let's just admit it. I used to work in a hospital, okay? But I want to call the message, I love the hospital. Would you say it like that with me? I love the hospital. Oh, it just feels gross to say it, doesn't it? feels kind of weird, but man, I love the hospital. The local church is a spiritual hospital. It's a hospital. Um, there are four accounts of Jesus' life in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew's written by a guy named, wait for it, Matthew. <laughs> and he gives us the story of how he met Jesus, and I think it's very much the story of how we all meet Jesus and how the church is a spiritual hospital, a spiritual hospital that offers people a few things. Let's look at them. Here's the first one. Through the church, and remember, the church is who? Us. Tell your neighbor, you're the church. Tell your other neighbor, I'm the church. Tell the person behind you, we're the church. All right, good. I just don't want you to think like through the church, some institution, some event. It is those things, but first and foremost, it is us. It is people. Okay, so the sermon point is through us. Okay, through us, through the church, Jesus provides hope. Hope. Everybody say hope. Jesus provides hope, not hype. Nothing wrong with hype. We get hype during worship. We like to do some fun videos every once in a while. Man, if you came to Rev Kids Sports Camp, that was as hype as it gets. It was insane. But it ain't about hype. Hype's just a tool. It's actually about hope. And everyone here knows what it feels like to be in a hopeless moment, right? Or a hopeless situation. I brought some pictures. Have you ever given a cat a bath? That is a hopeless situation, right? Look at that cat. No! Right? Hopeless situation. Or how about this? Have you ever been so loaded down? Right? Now, we laugh, but we, we know what that stuff actually feels like, right? To actually be in such a hopeless situation, because we've all been through something like that. And by the way, um, breaking news, we'll all probably go through something like that again at some point in life. Good news for you. Jesus knows how to help hopeless people. Somebody in the service right now is struggling with an addiction and you feel completely hopeless. Somebody in the service right now is struggling in their marriage and you feel hopeless. Somebody watching online right now, they're, they're struggling with their children and they got a teenager and they just don't know what to do and it feels completely hopeless. Somebody in the room right now is struggling with anxiety or depression and it feels completely hopeless. Somebody's struggling with some kind of financial issue, or you don't know if you're even going to have a job tomorrow when you walk in, and, and it feels completely hopeless. But the good news is Jesus, through the church, he knows how to help hopeless people. Look at verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Now, when we read tax booth and tax collector in the Bible, I think that we think wrong. We think IRS, we think uh, Tom Hanks chasing Leonardo DiCaprio for writing fake checks, whatever. We, that's what we think, okay? Um, but back then, tax collector was the scum of the earth. If you read through the Bible, have you ever noticed how several times it says sinners and tax collectors? Isn't that interesting? It's because the tax collectors were seen as even worse than the sinners, so in the Bible, the writers a lot of times will say sinners and tax collectors, and everybody's like, ooh. Have you ever met someone that just gave you the hibby-jibbies, just said, ooh, ooh, don't point. Have you ever met someone like that? <laughs> That's the tax collectors back then. I mean, if, when you saw one, you would just shiver. Here's why they were seen as the scum of the earth. See, Rome was in charge, and Rome had decided to sell the rights to tax people to local people. And the way it worked was you could literally, if you bought the right to tax people, you could tax people on anything you want, anything. You could invent the toothbrush tax, the, the tea tax, the, it, just literally anything. The, I don't like your haircut tax, like just anything. And that's what these guys did. As long as Rome got their cut, they didn't care what you taxed the people on. So picture this, your own countrymen who are supposed to be with you, kind of going against Rome, buy the right and start taxing you. You see why they hated him so much? 
I mean, these guys are traitors. They are extorting their own countrymen. That's Matthew. And as he sits alone in that tax booth taxing people, you got to know that everyone hates him. They're sneering at him. He knows they hate him. He knows he's the worst of the worst. He probably feels like he knows he's on the highway to hell, right? He knows that. And yet it says Jesus saw him. The worst of the worst. Why? Because Jesus always sees hopeless, hurting people. He always sees that, and he always understands their pain. And if you need evidence, like I don't know if Jesus understands my pain, look no further than the cross. The cross that he got on and gave his entire life for you and I. He understands our pain. He understands our hurt. And best of all, see, three days later, he got up out of the grave, so he knows how to lead you out of the hopeless situation. That's the very best part of the whole thing. He knows how to walk out of it. So he sees Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Look at what it says next. And he said to him, this is crazy, follow me. That's it. He didn't say anything else. Follow me. And he rose and he followed him. Imagine that. The perfect son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, God in a bod, God that left his throne room, came to heaven, says to the scum of the earth, hey man, follow me, period. Sentence over. Follow me. Let's go. Don't you know that made everyone that's right there waiting in the tax line to pay their taxes so uncomfortable? I mean, these guys are thinking, Jesus, don't you mean stop taxing people? Then he can follow you. Jesus, don't you mean stop extorting people in all these stupid ways? And then, and then he can follow you. Isn't that what you mean, Jesus? Jesus says, no, follow me. Because Jesus knew something that I think we forget so easily something that we need to remember, and that's that people don't need to stop anything that they're doing to follow Jesus. In fact, it's the other way around. People need to follow Jesus so they can actually stop what they're doing. And if you're a Christ follower, you've got to amen that because you've got to know that that's true, that you didn't have the power when you were hopeless to overcome that thing until you decided to follow Jesus. Why then do we so often kind of just stand back when people are hopeless and bark at them? No, 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 follow Jesus, but not until you do this, this, and this, A, B, and C. Not until you complete this and that. Not until you've been there long enough or go to this class or know this Bible verse. He didn't say any of that. He gave zero conditions to the scum of the earth. He just said, follow me. That's us. That's this church. We're a guilt-free, graceful church where everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible. What does that mean? That means you can come and follow him no matter who you are, no matter what kind of lifestyle, no matter what kind of belief system. You can choose the, the, the faith-filled step to follow him today. We invite you to do that. Is our heart for you to become more like him and change? You bet yourself it is. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. But we've experienced it, and we know that can't happen until you follow him. So we invite you to follow him. Jesus could have had the ministry of stop for three years, right? But he didn't do that. He could have walked around, hey, stop collecting taxes. Stop extorting people. Hey, you stop that. Y'all stop being uh, this way. You, you stop selling yourself to men. You stop this. You stop. He never once had the ministry of stop in the entire scripture. He didn't do that. He just said, hey, follow me. I want you to follow me. We call that starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. And see, the, the place that that understanding really comes from is the idea and the understanding that we all have a next step to take, that we all still have a ways to go, <laughs> that none of us are perfect. How many parents in the room? Where are you at? Put your hands up, parents. How many of you remember your child's very first steps, first child's first steps? Wasn't that amazing? What a crazy experience. But can I tell you what really happened? Your kid didn't take a step. They didn't take a step. The first step wasn't a step. The first step was a, a barely move forward, fall down kind of dance thingy, right? It wasn't a step. But what did you do? You said, my child can walk. Look at this. Really all they did is kind of and fall down. Bang their head on something, right? What did you do? You just picked them up. All right, let's do it again. Let's do it again. You go, let's go for two steps this time. Come on, you can do it. And it was a several week process of them actually getting to the point where they're doing this. I, I've never met a parent who, when their child took that very first step, said, is that all you can do, you baby? Come on, you can do better than that. 
That'd be ridiculous, right? Yet that's kind of what we do spiritually in church all the time, is it not? It's kind of what we do with people who aren't believers or brand new believers in church. Come on, are you kidding me? That's the best step you can take? That's not what we do here at this church. Here we just pick them up, just like you did your kid. Come on, let's do it again. That's all right, you fell down, but let's do it again. We just dust them off, all right? It's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. Let's not, let's not step backwards, let's not go that way again. Let's move forward, okay? We're here to help you move forward. We're here to help you take your next step, and every one of us has a next step to take. And this church is not about clogging the way for people to take steps. We're about clearing the way for people to take steps. It should be as easy as possible for somebody to take their next step. Don't you want it as easy as possible for, for you to take your next step? We all have a step. Some of you need to be baptized. Some of you need to take the very first step and give your life to Christ, and that might happen today. Some of you just need to actually come to church like weekly. You need to make this like a weekly thing. We're here every week. I don't know if you knew that. Every week. We do this every week. <laughs> Some of you need to join the dream team and begin to serve because you say, I love my church, but it's not really your church because you, you're not stepping up yet. Some of you need to jump into a small group or teach a small group, or if you're struggling with an addiction, you need to go to celebrate recovery and begin to conquer that. Some of you need to start to just share your faith. You're handing out the invite cards that we give out, and that's great, that's awesome, but you need to actually make words come out of your mouth about Jesus and talk to people about your story and, and what he's done. And every one of us can do this. Why? No matter how, hope, how hopeless we might feel, we can do this. Why? Because he's our hope. We have this hope, Hebrews says, as an anchor for our soul. This place is a place that provides hope. Everybody say hope. hope. All right, here's the second one. Through the church, again, that's you and I. Jesus provides a heart. There's a hope, there's also a heart. There's a right heart that has to be behind the entire thing. And I just wanted to ask you today, is your heart in alignment with the heart of Jesus Christ? When I had my very first full-time student ministry position, um, I was actually like an interim guy. I had been an intern the youth pastor left, the church asked me, will you just run the youth group stuff? I said, sure, but I need to know, like, what do you actually want me to do? And they said, we want, to, we want you to reach kids, obviously. And I said, brace yourselves. <laughs> and so we went from about 30 or 40 kids in a year to several hundred kids. And most of the kids that I was good at naturally reaching, I don't like using the stereotypical words, but I will just to help share the story. Uh, they were like the skater kids, the druggy kids, kids that were all black, that kind of thing, right? They didn't look like the original 30 or 40 church kids, okay? And so after we had hundreds of kids come, and this guy comes up to me one weekend, and he says, what are we going to do about these kids? And I didn't even understand the question. I'm like, what do you mean? They're here. Isn't this awesome? He's like, no. I mean, like, look at how they're dressed. What are we going to do about this? Like, look at how they act. What are we going to do about this? And I remember thinking, like, what? We're not going to do anything about it except keep sharing Jesus with them. I'm not going to ask them to change their shirt because they won't come to church anymore. I don't care what's on their shirt, I care about what's in their heart. Is that your heart? How about you, what's your heart? Jesus cares about the heart. The heart matters so much. We had a guy show up here at church several years ago, he's a biker dude on his motorcycle, which I love, and he had a shirt that said, my give a damn is busted. <laughs> and this lady comes over to me and she's like, did you, did, pastor, did you see his shirt? I was like, I love that guy. His shirt's awesome. We should put him at the front door greeting everybody because clearly he's not scared. This is great. She's so freaked out that her child might, and I get it. I have kids too, okay? But man, your kids are hearing worse stuff at school every day. They're probably hearing worse stuff come out of your mouth. Let's be honest, right? Come on. And we act like, oh, it's a bad person. It's a bad person. A lot of churches wouldn't let someone like that in. That breaks my heart. I hear that all the time. It breaks my heart to hear that. Because you know who did let people like that in? Jesus. Look at the next verse, verse 10. As Jesus reclined at the table in the house, that, that's crazy right there. I mean, how many of you go over to a house party and put your feet up on the kitchen table? <laughs> Clearly, Jesus is comfortable, right? Right? He reclined at a table in the house. Behold, who's he reclining with? I love it. Many sinners and tax collectors. Wow. 
Many. Y'all know the disciples like to count, right? Because there's other places in Scripture we know the exact number of men or the exact number of people present, the exact number of people that were fed. Right here, the party's still bumping, and there's just people having so much fun that the disciples are like, forget it, we're not counting tonight. Let's just put in the Bible, many. <laughs> many tax collectors and sinners came, and they must have been comfortable with Jesus, because what are they doing? And we're reclining with Jesus and his disciples. I love that. Don't you know that whole thing had to be kind of uncomfortable? Because here's Jesus again, left his perfect throne room in heaven, leaves ultimate perfection with the Father, right? Seated at the right hand, comes to earth to hang with the scum of the earth. Wow, Jesus intentionally sets aside his comfort, says, I'm willing to get uncomfortable so that people can meet Christ, so people's lives can be changed. How about you. You might have to be willing to give up some of your comfort if you're really going to be on mission, if you're really going to be the church. You know, as Christians, we're called to be comfortably uncomfortable. You realize that, right? We're called to be people who get to a place where we're like, yep, this world's not my home. It's just never really going to be that comfortable to get comfortable with that idea. Why? So that other people can be comforted with the gospel, so other people's lives can be changed. I love that Jesus models to us. It wasn't about his preferences because it's certainly not about ours. It's not all about me and it's not all about you. It's about people who are far from Christ. Is that your heart? Do you have a heart for people who are broke, busted, and disgusted? Do you have a heart for that? Do you have a heart for people who are far from Christ, who are hurting people that Jesus loves? That's the heart we're called to have. That's the heart of this church. When you say, I love my church, that's the heart behind the thing you say you love. Comfortably uncomfortable, willing to do whatever it takes to reach people far from God. Look at the next verse, verse 11. When the Pharisees, stop right there. When the Pharisees, everybody say Pharisees. Pharisees. I want to stop right there because you, you got to remember the Pharisees are the guys who killed Jesus. You realize that, right? So when you read the word Pharisees in the Bible, I think it's good for you as you study the Bible and read the Bible, just stop right there. When you read Pharisees, just stop and hear this in your brain. Shark week, right? Boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Just hear that, okay? Because these guys are sharks, all right? They killed Christ. When the Pharisees saw this, they see this whole thing happening, they said to his disciples, I love that they're scared to go to Jesus straight by this point. They're just like, let's go say it to the other guys. He'll, he'll punk us, all right? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, from day one, people have never understood that. Religious people? Religious people have never understood the agenda that Jesus had. All they've understood is their little system, their agenda. See, the Pharisees had a system. They, they had an agenda. Their system was this. This is what we believe, and this is how we behave. And when you believe like we be believe and behave like we behave, then you can belong with us. It was like this. The Pharisees had it backwards. Behave, believe, belong. Jesus shows up and goes, guys, you need to flip the whole thing around. It's not behave, believe, belong. It's actually belong, believe, behave. This is how Jesus did it. And I think so, so often in church, remember who's the church? We are, so often in our minds, I'm saying, we get this mixed up and we get this wrong. And isn't it funny how we get it wrong so quick? Because we all know that we needed to belong first. But then at some point after belonging for a while and learning to believe and behave and kind of getting it together a little bit, we should on people. You should do this and you should do, we just should all over them, don't we? We just should on people. You should, you shouldn't, blah, 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 blah. And, and what are we saying? We're saying, you need to behave first. And if, if you behave and believe, we'll figure out the belonging thing. Maybe. We'll see. Here's what we got to understand. Jesus Christ died on a cross. They put him in a tomb. Three days later, he rose again. And then he told the first church to go and tell everybody about it. He commanded us to be found people who find people. Plain and simple. That's the bare bones basics of the gospel. And the religious people of his day, they watched him and they never understood that. They never got the basic idea that anyone can come to the kingdom of God. And that at the end of the day, you know what you and I do as the church? We just play 
spiritual matchmaker, hooking people up with Jesus. That's what we do. That's who we're called to be. That's the heart. There's a hope and there's a heart. Is that your heart? And are you willing, wheel, willing, willing? Are you willing to wheel and deal? That's what I was trying to say. Are you willing to wheel and deal the hope of Jesus Christ? What's, what's last? Here's the last one. Through the church, you and I, Jesus provides healing. Healing. Now, some people think, well, I don't know. I, n- I never got healing in the church. Let me tell you a story. Um, I'm an all-in person, if you haven't noticed. All or nothing. Okay, if I'm going to do something, I'm going all in. I'm not doing anything halfway. It's either all or nothing, okay? That's how I jump into stuff. And my son in April had his 11th birthday. He said, I want to go to a, one of those trampoline parks. I was like, cool, let's go. So we took a bunch of adults and kids to this trampoline park. And I noticed none of the adults were jumping, except for Amber's mom and my mom, which is pretty crazy that the grandmas were jumping. Just me and the grandmas having fun, jumping with the kids. And all the adults are kind of making fun of me, like, look at Zach. And I'm like, y'all are all losers. I'm just jumping, having fun. Ah, y'all are morons. You could be having fun. And then this guy walks up, one of the guys that runs the place, and he goes, hey, uh, I can see that you really are enjoying the trampolines. I'm like, yeah, baby, just jumping around, flipping and stuff. And he goes, have you done the mega jump? I'm like, take me there. So he walks me over to this trampoline. I'm not playing. It has a ladder you climb up and a tiny little ledge you stand on, and then you jump. And it, it's probably only 30 feet, but man, it looks like 100 feet down there. I mean, it's scary. So I get up there, and I'm thinking, mm, maybe I should just climb down. I'm a little too old for this, probably. But there's all these kids at the bottom. I don't even know who they are. There's all these kids. Zach, 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 Zach. So I'm like. And then I just jumped. And nothing happened. I just had fun. I was bouncing. And man, and hardly anyone else was doing it because it's pretty intense. So I'm like, yeah, this is me. I'm all in. Ah." Well, I found out if you jump hard enough, you don't even have to climb up the ladder. You can just jump up onto the wall and like land on it. So now I'm like bouncing onto the wall, off of the wall. I'm jumping up. I'm grabbing the beam on the ceiling and hanging on it Ah! like Michael Jordan style and then coming down. And I got a little cocky and I came down wrong and my ankle went in a direction it shouldn't go and made a noise it shouldn't make. That was on a Friday. I had to preach on Sunday. I did a pretty good job covering it up. I don't think any of y'all noticed. I just kind of stood like this the entire sermon. (laughs) Amber's like, are you okay? Are you okay? And all the adults are like, that's why we're not jumping. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I'm just trying to play it off. We leave the party. She's like, are you okay? Really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm totally fine. Totally fine. (laughs) It took me until Tuesday to admit I had a problem. Finally, I was like, you need to go to the doctor. I went to the doctor and, you know, the rest is history. It still hurts, but I'm kind of healing up a little bit. And um, I'll tell you that story because if if your heart's kind of like, well, I don't know if the church is really a place of healing, it could be that you never admitted you need some healing. Because the first step to being healed is admitting that you need some help. It's being willing to, to just admit, you know, I'm not okay. And I want you to know One of the reasons you love this place is this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. You don't have to be okay when you walk into this place. You don't have to play church. How are you today? I'm good. (laughs) Don't do that. Say, I'm not good. And someone will pray with you. Say, I'm not good. Here's what I'm struggling with. And we'll do our very best. We're not perfect, but we'll do our very best to get you the help you need, the healing you need. Why? Because it's a hospital. What do hospitals do? They, they do their very best to heal people, but you got to initiate your healing. You got to be willing to admit that you need it. Now, some people think like, well, Zach, if we don't expect people to believe and behave first, how could they ever be healed? Like if we don't preach on how bad they are, if we don't, I went to New York City one time and there was this dude standing on the corner with one of these, bullhorn guy. And he was like, repent now, <laughs> sinners. Hope you have shorts, hell's going to be hot. He was just yelling this hateful stuff on a bullhorn at people and like getting people's attention with it and stuff. I wanted to beat the guy. I I lost my religion for, I don't, maybe I could have. I mean, I was in New York, probably no one would have known me. (laughs) It drove me nuts because I think sometimes people have, like if we don't hold up protest signs and if we don't scream on the news and if, listen, here's the problem with that. That's not going to help anyone heal. That's not a heart of healing. That's a heart of hurting. 
all that will do is drive people further into their sin, further away from God. And people show up at our church all the time, and it breaks my heart, and they say, you know why I stopped going to church for so long? People, this is so normal here. People will say, I'll say, is this your first time at our church? And they'll say, this is my first time in any church in a very long time, a very long. Some people will say 40 years. I just met a guy a couple weeks ago. It's been 40 years since he walked into a church. You know what I hear every time? I hear, I was tired of hearing about how bad I was for an hour every week. It didn't help me. It just drove me further away from God. And I'm thinking, yeah, that would drive me further away from God too, to just go and hear that I'm bad for an hour. And that's not how Jesus did it. Look at verse 12. But when he heard it, he said, this is Jesus, he hears the Pharisees, okay, and their silly little question, and he says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. That's where the hospital mentality comes from. He's saying, I came for those who are sick. I'm hanging out with these people because I know they need help. I'm building a relationship with these people because they're spiritually sick. And you know why the people that he said that in front of that that were spiritually sick weren't offended? Because he had built a relationship with them. See, he had built the relationship first. He had made it about the people first. He had willed and dilled the hope first, and he had the right heart first. And then, then God could use him to speak and to bring healing. And what happens is so often in church, we're like bullhorn guy. We want to make a point. I got a point to make. I got a point to make. I need to make a point. We're here to make a point. You're not here to make a point. Jesus made the point at the cross. Jesus can make any future point he wants to make just fine on his own. He doesn't need your assistance. You're not here to make his point. You're here to be his difference in this world. His hands and feet, scripture says. That's a heart of healing. Is that your heart when it comes to people who need to be healed? Or do you want to rush out and tell people everything they did wrong before you have a relationship with them? That's not going to work. It's not going to work. And listen, if you're here today and you would admit, yeah, I'm spiritually sick, I need help. Here's what I believe. No one has to even tell you that. You know it. You know it because you know you keep going back to the same sinful pattern, right? You know it because you know that you continually struggle with that exact same thing. My question is, have you admitted it before God? Because then, and only then, can you be on the road to healing. It's kind of like um, we've had several times in the life of our church um, where we found drugs in the bathroom, like after church. Or uh, we've had times when people put pills and even pornography into the offering bucket, which people are like, oh my gosh, but I think it's cool because it's like, here, God, take this from me. I don't know what to do. God, just take it from me. I love that. I love those kinds of weekends. And, and, and religious people have never understood that. Why would you like that? That's not holy and it's in the church. It, that's the most holy thing that could happen in the church. That somebody surrenders something to God, that, that somebody goes all in with Jesus. In the Bible, the Pharisees, mm-hmm. They're the only ones who never understood that. They're the only ones who never actually followed Jesus into healing people. And so Jesus says this to the Pharisees, most offensive thing he could say, y'all think Jesus is some like soft, uh, white-robed hippie? You're wrong. You're wrong. He liked to pick fights. Look at this. Jesus said, go and learn. Think about who he's saying it to. He's saying it to the Pharisees, the guys who are supposed to have learned it all, the guys who who know the entire first five books of the Bible, cover to cover. Like These are the guys that everyone else went to learn from. And he tells them, (laughs) go and learn. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. See, church should never be a perfect place full of perfect people with zero problems. First of all, if you think it's that, you're lying to yourself anyway. What it should be is full of broken people. Broken people, hurting people, people who were hurting and hopeless, people who needed healing, but then met the healer himself, Jesus Christ, who saved them and who is making them brand new as they continue to walk with him each and every day. That's what a church looks like. And that's why I love my church. Like, that's something to truly love your church for. And we're not stopping when it comes to reaching people ever, period. 
ever, ever, ever. We're not stopping. We're going to continue reaching people. A church like that, a church with the hope, a church with the right heart, a church that it's all about healing, a church with this hospital mentality will continue to grow. And don't, don't believe a lie that you attend some tiny little church. I just got to tell you straight. You attend a very large church spread over five services, over a thousand people every weekend. We've been over a thousand people every weekend, even in the summer, which blew my mind. I thought for sure it's summer. It's going to go down to like 850, 900. Nope. People's lives keep getting changed. We baptized 19 people a couple weekends ago. It's crazy. What's that about? How does that happen? It happens when we have this hospital mentality. I love the hospital. Now, some people might say, well, I'm not sure I could go to a church that gets much bigger than this one is. Listen, I love you, but I got to tell you what you're saying. You need to understand what you're saying when you say, I don't like a big church. You're saying there's too many people meeting Jesus. You're saying there's too many teenagers that aren't going to go down the road of regret I went down. You're saying there's too many little kids over there learning about how much God loves them. You're saying there's too many marriages being healed. I just don't know about that. You're saying there's too many addicts who are having the chains broken of addiction. You're saying there's too many people going to heaven. When you put it that way, it kind of sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? When we do church the way God has called us to, and we literally are the people he's called us to be, the church will grow. And here's what I've learned. Last little thing. You can write it down if you want. The more conscious I become of the work God has yet to do in me, the less critical I become of the work I perceive he has left to do in someone else. So maybe this all starts with understanding that we still need some healing, that we still need some hope, that we still need to get the heart. This is a spiritual hospital. And I love my church. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I want to ask you very straightforward, what's your next step? It's time to stop playing around and it's time to take the step. Enough is enough. Do you need to join a group? Do you need to join the dream team? Do you need to begin to give? Do you need to begin to bring people to share your faith? I believe God speaks very clearly to our hearts and he's speaking to you right now if you'll allow him to. What is it you need to do? What's your next step? It's time to take it. And if your next step is the very first step, giving your life to Christ, We wanna help you take that step right now. It's nothing more than a simple step of faith. A step of faith no one can take for you, a step of faith you have to go all in with, all on your own. And it's as simple as telling God you're ready. So if that's you, just tell him you're ready. Pray something like this. You say, Jesus, I give you my life right now. I confess you're my Lord, you're my Savior. I surrender all to you. I repent from my sin and I turn to life with you. I ask you to make me a brand new person. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give it up, church, for anyone taking that step for what God's doing here today. Come on.